Homily 21 on Ephesians 6. 1. 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Ephesians 6, 1, 3. St. Paul develops his theme in an orderly fashion. He has spoken first concerning the husband, then the wife, who is second authority. Now he proceeds to the next rank, namely the children. The husband is the head of the wife, and husband and wife together have authority over the children. Listen to what he says. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is the first commandment with a promise. He will not speak here about Christ or other lofty subjects, but will direct his words to young minds. That is also why this passage is very short, since children have a short span of attention. Nor does he speak here about the kingdom to come, since children would not be able to understand. But he tells what a child's soul wants to hear most, how to have a long life. If anyone wonders why he doesn't speak about the kingdom of God, but simply gives them the Old Testament commandment, it is because he addresses the children on their own level, and because he is well aware that if husband and wife order their lives according to God's law, their children will also submit willingly to the same law. The most difficult element in any undertaking is to lay a good, strong foundation based on sound principles. Anything begun this way will easily proceed to the proper conclusion. Children, he says, obey your parents in the Lord, that is to say, in accordance with the Lord, for so has God commanded you. What if my parents command me to do things that are wrong, you might ask? Well, even when a parent does wicked things himself, he usually doesn't force his children to imitate him. However, St. Paul has left us a provision in this case by saying, Obey your parents in the Lord, that is, whenever they tell you to do what is pleasing to God. So if your father is an unbeliever or a heretic and demands that you follow him, you ought not to obey because what he commands is not in the Lord. Now why does St. Paul say that this commandment is the first to be joined with a promise? Notice that the other commandments, such as thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not commit adultery, have no reward attached to them, since God gave these commandments to make us avoid evil things. But the commandment to honor our parents concerns something good, so a reward is promised for those who keep it. See what an admirable foundation St. Paul lays for a virtuous life, honor and respect for one's parents. This is the first good practice commanded us in the Scriptures, because before all others except God, our parents are the authors of our life, and they deserve to be the first ones to receive the fruits of our good deeds. Only after we honor our parents can we do anything good for the rest of mankind. If a man does not honor his parents, he will never treat other people with kindness. He has given the children the most important advice, so he continues by saying to the fathers, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. He does not say, Love them. He would regard such a commandment as superfluous, trusting that nature will draw even unwilling parents to the love of their children. What does he say? Do not provoke your children to anger, as many by disinheriting and disowning them or by overburdening them as if they were slaves and not free. But most importantly, he shows that the father, as the head and source of authority in the family, is responsible for leading his children to obedience. As the wife must submit to her husband, and the husband must make himself worthy of her obedience by the power of love, likewise he must also bring his children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Concern for spiritual things will unite the family. Do you want your child to be obedient? Then from the beginning, bring him up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Don't think that it isn't necessary for a child to listen to the Scriptures. The first thing he will hear from them will be, Honor your father and your mother. And immediately, you will begin to reap 
your reward. Don't say, Bible reading is for monks. Am I turning my child into a monk? No, it isn't necessary for him to be a monk. Make him into a Christian. Why are you afraid of something so good? It is necessary for everyone to know scriptural teachings, and this is especially true for children. Even at their age they are exposed to all sorts of folly and bad examples from popular entertainments. Our children need remedies for all these things. We are so concerned with our children's schooling. If only we were equally zealous in bringing them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And then we wonder why we reap such bitter fruit when we have raised our children to be insolent, licentious, impious, and vulgar. May this never happen. Instead, let us heed the blessed Paul's admonition to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Let us give them a pattern to imitate. From their earliest years, let us teach them to study the Bible. He repeats this over and over again. You say, we are sick of listening to it. Never will I stop doing my duty. Why do you refuse to imitate the holy men and women of old? Tell me, especially you mothers, think of Hannah's example. Look at what she did. She brought Samuel, her only son, to the temple when he was only an infant. Who among you would not rather have a son like Samuel than one who became king of the whole world ten thousand times over? But it's impossible, you say, for my son ever to become as great as he. Why is it impossible? Because you don't really want it. You won't entrust him to thee. One who is able to make him great, and who is that? God. Hannah commended Samuel into the hands of God. The high priest Eli had no real ability to form him, since he even failed to form his own children. It was the mother's faith and zeal that made everything possible. He was her first and only child. She didn't know if she would ever have another, yet she never said, I'll wait until he grows up. He should have a taste of worldly pleasures during his childhood at least. No. She rejected all these thoughts, for she had only one object, how from the very beginning she could dedicate her heart's delight to God. Be ashamed, you men, at the wisdom of this woman. She gave Samuel to God, and with God she left him, and thus her marriage was blessed more than ever, because her first concern was for spiritual things. She dedicated the first fruits of her womb to God, and obtained many more children in return. She saw Samuel honoured even in this life. If men return honour for honour, will not God do much more? He gives so much even to those who don't honour him at all. How long are we to be mere lumps of flesh? How long will we cling to the ground? Let everything take second place to our care for our children, our bringing them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. If from the beginning we teach them to love true wisdom, they will have greater wealth and glory than riches can provide. If a child learns a trade or is highly educated for a lucrative profession, all this is nothing compared to the art of detachment from riches. If you want to make your child rich, teach him this. He is truly rich who does not desire great possessions or surround himself with wealth, but who requires nothing. This is how to discipline and teach your child. This is the greatest riches. Don't worry about giving him an influential reputation for worldly wisdom, but ponder deeply how you can teach him to think lightly of this life's passing glories. Thus, he will become truly renowned and glorious. Whether you are poor or rich, you can do this. These lessons are not learned from a skillful professor, but from divine revelation. Don't ask how he can enjoy a long life here, but how he can enjoy an infinite and eternal life in the age to come. Give him the great things, not the little things. Don't strive to make him a clever orator, but teach him to love true wisdom. He will not suffer if he lacks clever words, but if he lacks wisdom, all the rhetoric in the world can't help him. A pattern of life is what is needed, not empty speeches, character, not cleverness, deeds, not words. These things will secure the kingdom and bestow God's blessings. 
don't sharpen his tongue, but purify his soul. I don't mean that worldly learning is worthless and to be ignored, but it should not be an exclusive preoccupation. Don't think that only monks need to learn the Bible. Children about to go out into the world stand in greater need of scriptural knowledge. A man who never travels by sea doesn't need to know how to equip a ship or where to find a pilot or a crew, but a sailor has to know all these things. The same applies to the monk and the man of this world. The monk lives an untroubled life in a calm harbour, removed from every storm, while the worldly man is always sailing the ocean, battling innumerable tempests. Would you like me to give examples of men whose lives were patterns of virtue, even though they lived in the world? These days we have none to compare with them, even among the righteous. I am referring to the holy men of the Old Testament. How many of them had wives and children, yet were in no way inferior to the greatest ascetic? Now, unfortunately, because of the present distress, this is no longer the case, as the blessed Paul has said. Of which of them should I speak? Noah or Abraham, the son of one or of the other, or Joseph? What about the prophets, such as Moses or Isaiah? If you will permit me, I will speak of Abraham, who in many ways is the greatest example of them all. Was he not married? Did he not have children? Yes, but these things in themselves did not make him remarkable. He was rich, but it was not his riches that made him pleasing to God. Why is he called wonderful? Because of his hospitality, his detachment from riches, and his well-ordered life. What makes a lover of wisdom? Does he not care little for wealth or fame? Does he not rise above envy and other evil passions? Consider what a lover of true wisdom Abraham was. First, he was not attached to his homeland. God said, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house. And immediately he went. He wasn't tied down to his house, or he never would have left it, or his friends or anything else, least of all money and fame. When he had defeated the four kings and was invited to take the spoil, he refused it. All these great men looked at this present life as nothing. They did not thirst for riches or other earthly attachments. Tell me, which trees are best? Do we not prefer those that are inwardly strong and are not injured by rainstorms or hail or gusts of wind or by any sort of harsh weather? but stand exposed to them all without fences or garden to protect them? He who truly loves wisdom is like this, and his riches we have already described. He has nothing, yet has everything. He has everything, yet has nothing. A fence does not provide internal strength, nor is a wall a natural support. They provide only artificial protection. What is a strong body? Is it not one that is healthy, whether hungry or surfeited, cold or warm? Or is it something that is dependent on restaurants, tailors, merchants and physicians for health? The truly rich man, the true lover of wisdom, needs none of these things, and that is why the blessed apostle admonishes us to bring our children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Don't surround them with the external safeguards of wealth and fame, for when these fail, and they will fail, our children will stand naked and defenceless, having gained no profit from their former prosperity, but only injury, since when those artificial protections that shielded them from the winds are removed, they will be blown to the ground in a moment. Therefore wealth is a hindrance, because it leaves us unprepared for the hardships of life. So let us raise our children in such a way that they can face any trouble and not be surprised when difficulties come. Let us bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Great will be the reward in store for us, for if artists who make statues and paint portraits of kings are held in high esteem, will not God bless ten thousand times more those who reveal and beautify his royal image? For man is the image of God. When we teach our children to be good, to be gentle, to be forgiving, all these are attributes of God, to be generous, to love their fellow men, to regard this present age as nothing, 
we instill virtue in their souls and reveal the image of God within them. This, then, is our task, to educate both ourselves and our children in godliness, otherwise what answer will we have before Christ's judgment seat? If a man with unruly children is unworthy to be a bishop, how can he be worthy of the kingdom of heaven? What do you think? If we have an undisciplined wife or unruly children, shall we not have to render an account for them? Yes, we shall, if we cannot offer to God what we owe Him, because we can't be saved through individual righteousness alone. If the man who buried his one talent gained nothing, but was punished instead, it is obvious that one's own virtue is not enough for salvation, but the virtue of those for whom we are responsible is also required. Therefore, let us be greatly concerned for our wives and our children and for ourselves as well, and as we educate both ourselves and them, let us beg God to help us in our task. If He sees that we care about this, He will help us. But if we are unconcerned, He will not give us His hand. God helps those who work, not those who are idle. No one helps an inactive person but one who joins in the labor. The good God Himself will bring this work to perfection, so that all of us may be counted worthy of the blessings He has promised through the grace and love for mankind of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom, together with the Holy Spirit, be glory, honor, and power to the Father, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen.